in painting. Whilst something we can do with digital images using AI actually has its roots way back in time before anyone even had an NVIDIA graphics card. Crazy, right? Well, in those days, trained art conservators would repair damage to things such as paintings, sculptures, statues and whatnot all without AI. Thankfully, these days we have computers to do in painting for us, but how can they seamlessly fill in those missing or damaged parts? Well, enter the concept of in painting. Through mathematical modeling and algorithmic innovations, computer scientists have gradually developed techniques to intelligently propagate surrounding pixel data into those missing image regions. Which brings us to BrushNet, released just recently. It uses stable diffusion to do the in-painting, though with it being so fresh and new, we don't yet have its power in Automatic 11.11 or Comfy UI. They do, however, give us a nice web interface to play with while we wait for the nerds to do their thing with the other interfaces. I've been playing with it for quite a while now, and so far I've been pretty impressed. In this video, you'll see not only how to install it on your own computer at home, but also how to avoid that installation. Right, let's get into it. If you don't have a powerful enough computer at home or don't like installing programs locally, then the Hugging Face space will be right up your alley. Just head on over to the URL in the video description and you're done. No installation necessary, all you need is a web browser. On the other hand, if you're like me and prefer to run these cutting edge AI programs at home, then it's time once again to crack open your terminal and through the power of Anaconda, create a fresh environment for this new Python application. As usual, links are in the video description for all this stuff, such as if it's your first time ever using Python and so haven't got Anaconda installed yet. They tested on PyTorch 1.12.1 with Python 3.9, so I figured I'd throw caution to the wind and totally ignore their test environment suggestion. Instead, I decided to go with the very latest PyTorch and Python 3.10. Turns out it works just fine, so if you do have a newer NVIDIA card that doesn't play well with those old PyTorch versions, then don't worry, you can indeed use the current release. Just the same as always, you start by creating a new environment using the conda create command. I already have a conda environment called diffusers, so I picked a really good alternative name instead. With your new environment created, it is time to move on to command number two, which is to activate it. Conda activate brushnet and you're done. You'll also need to download the Git repository using the standard git clone command. Don't forget you can quickly and easily snag the URL from the top of the page for this command number three. Once that's downloaded, don't forget to change into your new directory with cd brushnet. Now you're ready to install the packages, remembering to check the link they provide to the official PyTorch installation instructions. As I mentioned a moment ago, I went with the current 2.2.2 version, which does indeed work OK. Simply click the grid options for whichever one you want, and the grid will show you the command you need to run. You can now run each of the commands they provide, remembering to replace the torch install command with the one you got from the grid. The first command will simply upgrade pip, then you run the one you got from the PyTorch website, and of course, the rest of the commands they have listed there. Once you've finished with that final pip install minus r requirements.txt command, you've downloaded all the code and installed all the required packages. What you need now is some models to work with. Their data download section provides all the information you need, including a link which has a bunch of models, but only two of them are the special brushnet ones. Over here on the Google Drive, you can see the ones with BrushNet in their name. Those are the two custom ones here, with these other ones just being standard stable diffusion checkpoints, but in the diffusers format. Their app expects to find models in the data checkpoint directory, which you will need to make yourself. You can optionally download the dataset for non-commercial use. You'll need to fill in a form to apply, so I just skipped that download and went straight onto those checkpoints. There's the link there to the Google Drive, and they show you the directory structure expected. There's my data checkpoint directory. As you can see, it's got the random brush net, the segmentation brush net, and also some standard stable diffusion checkpoints. 
Now, as you do need them in Diffusers format, if you don't already have a bunch of Diffusers versions available, and you can download the pre-converted models they provide. Like they say here, you can also use the script to convert any models you may have already downloaded. As with any typical Python program, you can run it with a minus minus help option, and that will show you all the available options that you have, as well as a little bit of help about them there. You've got the full command. As you can see, there's absolutely loads of things. So I'll just give you a quick example of what you'll need, the minimum version basically to convert a checkpoint. So here I'm using the minus minus checkpoint path option, and I'm pointing it to the real cartoon realistic model safe tensors I have in Comfy UI. I'm using the from safe tensors option because it's a safe tensors file, and dump path is the option to say where you want it outputted to, which in this case is data checkpoint real cartoon realistic. They don't seem to mention it anywhere, but for the Gradio interface we'll run in just a moment, you'll also need a segment anything model. This model can be downloaded from Hugging Face if you don't already have it. If, like me, you do have the file already thanks to Comfy UI, in this case I suggest you use a symbolic link and save a little bit of disk space. Feel free to just copy it, of course, if that's your whim. Whatever the case, it needs to be straight in there in the data checkpoint directory. Now, even though you can use any stable diffusion checkpoint, it does expect the name to be Realistic Vision version 60B1 underscore yeah, that long name there. So in this case, I don't actually have that model because I did that conversion earlier with the script. In my case, that is instead a link to the real cartoon realistic model. Um, now, there isn't actually a way to change the model in the Gradio interface anyway, so if you do want to use different models, you're just going to have to call the directory that. Or, like me, just make lots of symbolic links each time. And there you have it. You now have everything you need to be able to run the Gradio app. They do have an inference script as well, should you wish. There it is then, the final command to copy and paste. Let's copy that, paste it in here, and start it up. It should only take a few seconds to start and then give you the URL you need, so go ahead and open that up in your web browser. If you scroll down, they have a bunch of examples at the bottom, but you can use your own images. Quickly going through the interface, you've got the click to seg options first, then the positive and negative prompt, options for blurred blending and invert mask, Clicking the little arrow will give you even more options there. You've got for control strength, the seed guidance scale, number of steps, and a place to upload your own mask. All pretty straightforward. Right, let's scroll back up and start off with a picture of a teddy bear sitting on a bridge. Now, I want him sitting on a table, so the first thing to do is define the mask. If I click on his chops, then it will automatically do the segmentation for me. I want the entire bear, so if I click on his body as well, that is much better. Now, I want to keep what I've masked, which is the bear in this case, and change everything else. This is where the inverse mask option comes in handy, so got to make sure that is ticked. Next, you're going to need a prompt. And in this case, I'll use a teddy bear sitting on an old wooden table. I'll maybe go for a random seed too, just because I like the chaos. Click run and it should work its magic. Wow, that really is pretty good. You actually get two pictures. Let's have a look at the other one. There's the other teddy bear on the table. I think he's really well positioned, his little leg just over the edge and everything. Okay, how about if we wanted some fireworks in the background as well? Let's see what happens in this case. Nice, once again, he's really well positioned and seems to fit into the scene, well, just perfectly. Now let's see what this blurred blending does. For this comparison I used a fixed seed, though I have noticed this isn't fully deterministic anyway. Okay, so here we've got image one, and then image two. Which one do you think's better? Image one, that teddy bear, or image two, that teddy bear? Well, the first one, this one, is without blending. 
And the second one here is with blending. Now, when we compare the two, you'll see they are very, very similar indeed. But one thing about the blurred blending image is I think the, the fur on the bear seems to have a bit more detail. And for me, at least, matches the color of the original bear a little bit closer. So there's the original image and the blurred one. And there's the non-blurred one. Let's bring the bear back so you can do the comparison. So there you go, those two. Personally, as I say, I think the blurred blending is just a little bit better. However, one thing with the blurred blending is you must use a strength of at least one. It isn't just about putting bears on tables, though. Their examples should give you all sorts of creative ideas, such as changing the background to a cake, changing clothes, or just background scenery. People are always fun, so how about a quick example of that? Right, so we've got photo of a woman there, and I think we'll do the obvious thing and keep her face to start with. And then, oh, I don't know why, let's just go for the whole body. We'll miss out that bag. We want her standing in the desert, so let's make that prompt a woman standing in the desert. We'll have a nice palm tree in the background too. Run that through and let's see how it comes out. Excellent, we've got a couple of images there. I'm going to have to make them a little bit bigger. Let's crack that open in a new tab. So there she is, standing in the desert. I think that's pretty good. Of course, you can also do things like change the clothing. So here we have another woman who is instead wearing a shining suit of armor. Sometimes, however, you can't quite get what you want. Like here, I want a painting of a rodent, but instead it's made those buildings, uh, well, more like buildings. In this case, what I can do is lower the strength a bit, perhaps somewhere down to around 0.5. Also, changing the guidance scale can help sometimes as well. And then running it through with those settings gives something a lot closer to what we asked for. Now, you may be thinking, how does this compare to in-painting in something like Comfy UI, especially with a new differential diffusion node which got added last month? Well, let's take a look and see. We've got a simple SDXL workflow for in-painting here, so what happens if we try to put our bear back on a wooden table? I know, so many puns. Anyway, let's do the segmentation again and see what happens. So we just right-click, open that up in SAM Detector, once again, I'll select the two areas and the detect, and now we've got a mask much like we had with the BrushNet interface. Right, so I queue that up and let's see what comes out. Oh, well, I mean, it sort of worked, it just doesn't look quite as awesome as it did with BrushNet. Okay, how about if we add a differential diffusion node? In case you've not used the differential diffusion node before, you can just pop it in there before your case sampler to make any model a little bit better at in-painting. Oh, and if you don't like making workflows, then you can grab these pre-made ones from my Patreon, along with other notes for this video as a thank you for helping to support the channel and allowing me to keep making these videos. Now, differential diffusion works more the more white there is in the mask, making things like depth maps or gradients great for masks. So as you can see there, everything in the white area is going to change and the black area, the teddy bear, we should keep. So let's run this through and let's see if it's any better. Hmm. Uh, no, not really. Now, it's not that you can't get good results with differential diffusion. It's just that I'm being naughty. So here we've got one with a gradient and that's a lot better. So that's got the original image nicely going through into our new one. As mentioned, you can, of course, also use things like depth masks. So here's a depth mask example, and this time we've got our teddy bear sitting on an alien planet. Got the depth mask up there, Zoe Depth, inverting that, so we keep the teddy bear, and the bits in white are the bits that have changed. So is one better than the other? Well, hopefully you've been able to see some of the different outputs and can tell which method you prefer for the task at hand. Fingers crossed it won't be long before we can use BrushNet in Comfy UI, or maybe even automatic, as it looks like they have plans for things like that in the future, sometime after their SDXL model is released. Until then, why not watch this next Nerdy Rodent video?